Our speaker today is Jeff Snobel. Schnabel. I knew I was going to do that right. Um, he is the director for the School of Architecture at Portland State University. And he is um, a co-founder of the Portland Winter Light Festival and a board member of the Willamette Light Brigade, a nonprofit dedicated to lighting Portland's bridges. Jeff is also a member of the International Nighttime Design Initiative and the Media Architecture Institute, none of which I understand, but I bet you he'll explain it to us. So that, uh, without further ado, please welcome Jeff. Well, thank you for inviting me. It's really a pleasure to be here. Um, uh, architects love talking about their work in themselves anyway, um, and so when we get a big crowd, it's even better. So uh, this is awesome. Uh, the presentation today, um, I'm going to definitely save room for questions at the end, and happy to kind of hang in there as, as long as, as you have questions. Um, they may kick us out, but we can talk outside if necessary. Uh, so, uh, but I'm going to run through the presentation, which is really kind of in two parts today. I'm going to talk about a little bit about nighttime and then how uh, humanity has begun to use nighttime and light in nighttime uh, in festival settings. So we're going to jump around. It's not chronological. Um, you're going to kind of get insights into how my crazy mind works because we are just going to jump around uh, from kind of project to project, event to event. And eventually then uh, we'll kind of go into part two, which is some shameless self-promotion about the Portland Winter Light Festival. Um, and you'll, you'll see it happening, uh, that, that, that promotion piece coming in. So um, uh, I'm gonna start with my first image, which is already up on the, which is already up on the screen. And, um, and that first image is black. It's the absence of light, right? And, oh, there we go. Thank you for setting the mood even, even more, right? Um, as human beings, we're not really built for nighttime, right? We are, we are uh, anatomically, right, we are meant to really kind of reside during daytime. And so as we've evolved, nighttime uh, has created uh, a different kind of condition for us, right? So it's the time when we typically go indoors. That's changing now. Uh, but historically, right, it was the time we went indoors. Uh, it's the time at which we slept, right? Um, and uh, it's the time that, uh, that we made love. Baby, more babies are conceived at night than during the day. I think we're all adults here. We can kind of face that reality. Um, there's, uh, but the important thing is that we absolutely treat daytime and nighttime as two very different conditions because they are fundamentally two very different conditions. So what happens then when we put ourselves in the context of nighttime and we add some light? What happens when we bring some light into that condition? It becomes kind of powerful, particularly historically when light was not a cheap commodity, right? We had um, only the privileged, the wealthy, could had the ability to kind of make light at night, right? So they had candles. A candle today, pff, go down, go to the dollar store, 10 candles for a dollar. Uh, but uh, historically, that wasn't the case. Um, whether it was a small oil lamp or a candle, um, human beings had to do an incredible amount of work to extract that material, and that material was expensive. So this idea of creating any light, any artificial light, not the stars and the moon, but any artificial light at night was really kind of a privileged thing. And we've kind of entered that period, and I'll talk a little bit about that. We've entered that period where, man, light, no big deal. Uh, we just, we, we do that in a room, right? And we've, all, we've got light. That's astounding. We're taking that for granted, but it's pretty miraculous. So a lot of these festivals, these light festivals that I'm going to talk about, were really kind of conceived of, and, and they emerged out of those origins when light was really special. It was, not, uh, it was not a common thing. It was a rare thing. And because it was a rare thing, 
um, it carried with it a lot of meaning, right? Which I think is an important thing for us to begin to recognize. Now, I'm, I'm breaking these meanings down into kind of religious and secular, right? And so in religious, uh, in, in the religious, light represented the divine. And it did so in our artwork, it did so in our rituals in the church, right? That the light, the light was the representation of our God, regardless of really just about any religion that you can, that you can look at, it carried that kind of weight. It also carried the weight of hope. It represented hope in those settings. Um, this one I like, victory over darkness. We win, right? We, we've introduced light. Darkness is no longer dominant, right? We have, we've inserted our power by adding that light. Uh, light, light represented uh, wisdom, right? And even today, right? Uh, how do we represent when somebody's gotten a good idea? We put a light bulb over top of their heads, right? So even today, right, that still, that still uh, sticks. And then oftentimes light was considered a gift, right? That you were, you were gifted. Um, and that connects with enlightenment, but um, this idea that uh, that light represented, it was so precious that if light was bestowed upon you, it was an amazing gift. Now, as, as, uh, as we've gotten into kind of more secular times for some of us, um, light still has some meaning. It still is potent, right? So light represents warmth, right? Um, or the promise of warmth. Uh, hospitality, right? Um, when you want to let your neighbors know that they're welcome to come over, what do you do? You turn the porch light on, right? When you don't want the trick-or-treaters to stop by, you turn the porch light off, right? That, that's our si light is that signal for hospitality. Light is, for many of us, safety, right? It represents that ability to be able to be out in the night and be safe. It's still a focus for gathering, which I'm gonna show you, uh, even in contemporary festivals, uh, people are drawn to a flame like moths uh, still. It's still innate uh, that, we, that we gather around that. And um, it also presents an important um, uh, kind of idea that we have these opportunities after dark, right? That light represents that we can be, uh, that we can still work we can still be productive even though the sun has gone down. Um, so it's probably time for us to get out of the dark. Uh, and I will show you my first slide. And I'm assuming that if I do that, it does work. And lo and behold, there we have the moon. And just a reminder that a human being's first light was not the lamp, was not the candle, was not the gas lamp, was not the arc light, was not the electric light bulb, but our first way of navigating and moving through this planet was through celestial bodies, right? And those celestial bodies changed over time, and they do contribute in terms of those early light festivals, those early kind of festivals that employ light, they were keenly aware of that factor of time, right? So you're going to see a lot of these festivals connect to things like the harvest, to an acknowledgement of the changing of the seasons, right? So even though we're going to be introducing uh, forms of light that humans are responsible for, in many ways they are still deeply connected to time and to celestial time. So, the power of the fire, right? Um, we are, I'm going to go back and forth uh, on a couple of slides here real quick. Uh, so, there are many reasons for that fire. Warmth was one of them. Uh, eventually, that became the place where our stories were told, right? Uh, where, and, and some would say, our cultures emerged. Um, out of this time, right? We couldn't be out there hunting and gathering anymore. We couldn't be working the fields anymore. The, there's nothing more to do with our animals. So this was some, and we hadn't gone to bed yet. This was our found time, right? And so culturally, that fire, that source of light, that thing that we created each evening was crucial to forming the cultures that, we have, that we've become today. And I would, I would make the case that the power that existed then when it comes to fires exists today as well, 
right? That we are still deeply connected with that as a, as a phenomenon. The other reason that that is really a potent kind of idea is that, right? And sorry about the grotesque nature of that, but it's really kind of, it's important that you understand, right, that anatomically we were built for day. At night, we go from being predator to prey, right? Now, why are we afraid of nighttime? Is it because of these deep-seated uh, understandings and fears uh, of, of being that predator or being that, that prey at night, perhaps? Uh, I'm not a psychologist, so I'll just put a question mark at. That's the safe thing. You can make a statement, but if you put a question mark at the end of it, right, then you're safe. So, um, so that's going to keep me safe, is that question mark. Um, but I kind of fundamentally feel like that may have something to do with it. One of the things that's interesting, though, is, excuse my coffee break, is in the lower part of that image, we get a really clear picture of what's going on there. Some poor animal, right, is dinner, right? And we're hoping that that animal wouldn't be us, right? Um, but equally and probably more frightening is that territory above those animals, right? Where we don't really know how many, what's out there. Um, one of my, there's a, an adage, the Italians have this adage, which is a, a great one, I love this. Um, uh, and, and that is, at night, all cats sound like leopards, right? <laughs> and I think that's a really great saying, right? That, um, and, I, and I find it to be true even, even to this day, right? That you hear something outside your window at night, and man, you know what? I can't believe there's a bear uh, in the city, and you go out there and there's a field mouse uh, out there, right? Um, nighttime does that to us. Sound changes at night, right? We lose all that ambient noise, so we can hear that scurrying. And, and then you add to that the tension that we have about nighttime, and all of a sudden, everything's a little bit bigger and a little bit scarier. The bottom is, I would argue, the contemporary horror film, right? The upper part of that is an Alfred Hitchcock horror film, right? <laughs> that he's leaving to your, mostly to your imagination all the bad stuff because in our heads he would contend that we can create much more frightening conditions than if, than if he just showed it to you. And I, I would say that that's what nighttime does. It cloaks, it makes a lot of things invisible. It hides, it conceals. Um, there's, uh, I know it's not uh, PC uh, to talk about this particular director, but there's a film called um, uh, oh, something in fog. Um, it's, I'm drawing a blank. What's that? Shadow, shadows in fog. Um, and it's a, a comedy, murder kind of mystery. Um, and uh, it's done in London. And you basically, the entire film, when they're outside, the furthest you can see away from them is kind of an arm's length from any character. So there's all this stuff kind of happening in the background, which adds to... Woody Allen, uh, adds to the kind of Woody Allen uh, mystique of that, that movie. But, but nighttime does that, right? It, it, it erases so much of the world so that when we add light, that light becomes really obvious, really, really potent. Okay, so we've talked a little bit about introducing that light into the world. And, um, and I would contend, as an architect, one of the things I'm interested in is that light is space. Right? So the light that's illuminating both of these paintings, right? their world is only as far as that light will reach, which meant early in human history at night, our worlds were pretty tightly constrained. Right? We didn't see 100 yards uh, out, out from the house. That was, just, that was just gone. That was just in darkness. So our spatial worlds were really, really tight. But we kept finding ways in which to bring uh, light into that mix. And I love this uh, particular Japanese print, which is um, a scene of them catching fireflies. That used to be an industry, is actually going out with nets and catching fireflies, putting them in these beautiful lanterns, <clears throat> and then 
they would sell those lanterns in the market so that people had a source of light. Now imagine how dark the world must have been at that point if you could actually get some benefit from a handful of fireflies uh, in a lantern, right? We've come a long, come a long way from that. And then we started to kind of, uh, we're starting to move towards, rather than this kind of personal light source, that light that's just about me, a little bit of space, and a little bit of light. And now we've got these Japanese lanterns that are starting, historically began to illuminate territory that wasn't personal territory that started to get out in the public realm, right? And that's where, uh, that's where things I think start to get interesting, right? Is where we're not just thinking about light with a particular task, but we're thinking about what kind of light are we putting out there um, for us to share, essentially. Because that's what light festivals are, ultimately, is a shared experience. And then technologically, we got uh, better and better. We started introducing street lamps. Uh, the French, when they introduced street lamps, and I know this is off topic a little bit from light festivals, but it's still fun to talk about. Um, so the French put out street lamps and why did they put out street lamps? Not to help people navigate the streets. It was a monitoring device. It was a way to kind of keep their eyes on all those people that might be up to no good, right? And the Parisians didn't really enjoy being monitored in that way. And so when uh, the French Revolution happened, many of the nobles were actually hung on the street lamps. Right? Because that was the symbol of their oppression. And we go, wow, what crazy times. The New York Times last week, I just read about how in Hong Kong, the street lights there are the places where they're putting the facial recognition cameras. And so what's the first thing that, when they're doing the protest, what's the first thing they're knocking down? The street lamps. Kind of fun when history comes around full circle on that. Right? Uh, in London, they put in street lamps because they had a really big problem with prostitution. And they were finally going to put some light on it and get rid of this problem. Yeah, they didn't go exactly like they thought. What they realized was that then the prostitutes were using the street lamps as a way of showing off their, their wares. <laughs> Otherwise, they had uh, in the darkness, right? So that was their opportunity. And even today, I would say, and uh, invite me back, and I'll, I'll, I'll have to do a whole thing on my rant on streetlights. But even today, we've got these unintended consequences when it comes to uh, introducing light in the public realm. Now, the reason that festivals are great is because we started to move from light, and this is um, <coughs> Tesla and Edison competing for uh, their system, their electrical system, at the Chicago World's Fair. You can imagine, right, when they threw the switch, uh, what happened. But this isn't light for navigation. This isn't light to monitor people. This is light for experience, to enrich people's experience. And by all accounts, they ended up with more visitors at night to the Chicago's World Fair than they did during the day. It was just that popular, all that light. Uh, Tesla won, by the way. Um, so, um, so this idea of light that can excite, can enrich, right? Um, and the fact that we had new types of technologies started playing out. This is the San Francisco World's Fair. Um, and those great big kind of rainbow lights that you see in the background, those are big spotlights that um, in opening night, they were like, oh my gosh, you can't hardly see them. Um, and so what they did was they quickly built some train tracks and brought in some steam engines and fired those steam engines up uh, all evening long to create enough moisture in the air that they could get that effect uh, from the festival, right? So, um, yeah, so we, I, that's another kind of takeaway, is we will go to really long lengths to make that, that light work uh, at night. But we're getting close to the light festivals. We're starting to get closer and closer here. Um, and then um, we started uh, making that light available in so many forms. Now we had colored light and flashing light. Um, and so we could make places really, really amazing. I show you a nighttime version of, of a carnival, 
Anybody been to a carnival during the daytime? Um, is there a much sadder experience um, than, than that? And part of that is, right, you can see the spilled popcorn on the ground, right? You can see the overflowing trash cans, um, right? All of the stuff that you don't, that doesn't necessarily contribute positively to your experience at night, that's all in the shadows. The thing that you've got, those, that popcorn's still on the ground, those trash cans are still overflowed, right? But our eye is drawn to the light, and particularly drawn to flashing light and colored light, right? So now, right, nighttime becomes the, the place where magic happens um, for these kinds of things. And we've gotten to the point now where light is so cheap, power is so cheap, lights are so easy, um, that we are at risk, I would make the case, maybe another conversation, but I would make the case that we've essentially created night, uh, daytime at night, right? That between street lights and between signage, um, we basically have struck out to create day at night. And that's not a new idea. Um, there is, uh, for a while there, they had these uh, arc lights that were so bright that they couldn't put them into a single street lamp. They were so intensely bright. Um, that they built these giant masts, and they did it in Detroit, and they did it in Austin, Texas. They had these giant mast lights that illuminate, literally made cities daytime at night. And so people started having to put shutters in their windows, not because of the sunlight during the day, but because of the arc light at night, right? That you had to keep the arc light from coming into your house. Needless to say, those didn't last that long. There, uh, if you go to Austin, though, they still have some of the mast lights there. They don't turn them on at night, but they still have the giant masts in place in several places in the city. So let's go back to when light was more precious, when it wasn't day at night, when, when, when um, introducing light was potent. And this is actually a festival that goes on to this day. And it is... Uh, a festival called Lori, L-O-H-R-I. And um, it's in the Middle East, and it's a midwinter festival that welcomes longer days. Uh, the bonfires are basically just the centerpiece for how we've used fires in the place for song and dance and stories, right? So it's just the centerpiece for other activities that are going on relative to that festival. Its origins, which meh, I think if you probably ask a young person at this festival, why does this festival exist? They may not be able to tell you, but the origins are that there was an individual named Dolabati who saved young women from slavery. And this was a celebration of that. But it's kind of grown out of that, as many of our festivals have, and, um, and the origins are, are long forgotten. One of my favorite things about this festival is that 10, between 10 and 15 days before the festival starts, the children go out and go door to door and ask people for wood to build that fire. Now it goes beyond that, and what they do is they take one, and I don't know how they decide who gets to be in this role, but they take one boy and they tie him onto a rope and they smear him with charcoal, and as they go door to door, they say, if you don't provide us with wood, we'll turn him loose. And, um, and so that's the motivation. for. And so if you look at that fire, that fire is not made up of beautifully sawn logs and things like that. It's scraps of wood that have come from the community to create that fire, which is in part, right, there are so many different bonfire rituals out there. I mean, I'm only going to touch just a slight fraction of, of all the rituals that are out there. But the reason I like this, right, is that there's a kind of a, a community-based kind of idea in it from the very start, that everybody has to contribute a little bit of wood, otherwise we don't get a fire. So that to me is a really kind of interesting idea about that. But let's start even smaller. Let's go down to even more kind of delicate fractions of, of light. And here we have Orthodox Easter. And what's interesting about that, because there's a, a lot of candle ceremonies, right? If you go to um, Norwegian strategies, right, you've got young ladies wearing candles on their heads. There's a lot of candle rituals. But what I love about this one is that the fire itself isn't just 
uh, a conventional flame, that that fire um, is a flame that originated in Jerusalem, and they take the trouble of, of like the Olympic torch, right, of getting it moving on and on. So that when you are having your ceremony in your Orthodox church somewhere in the world, that flame originated from Jerusalem. It instantly kind of connects you back to that place. And that's where it starts to get its potency. This is um, Makabucha Day. Um, and these pronunciate, I'm from West Virginia. So all of these pronunciations have a slight, if not profound, West Virginia uh, take on the pronunciations. So you'll have to forgive those. Um, but it's a Buddhist tradition. Uh, but it happens in, in Thailand, Cambodia, Cambodia, and Laos. And um, what I love is the sheer number of participants, right? So the power of not a single light, but all these multiple of lights. And the reason that there's a sheer number of these participants is that the origins of this particular festival is that 1,250 enlightened disciples of Buddha spontaneously gathered without invitation or communication. So this is that way, right, of them going, that was miraculous, that all of a sudden, 1,200 of us showed up one day as a gathering. Did you know? I didn't know. Did you know? I didn't know. Nobody got an invitation. So this, it was such a big, potent idea, an affirmation of their belief system that every year we're going to acknowledge that particular moment in our history. And then to introduce the idea of light just kind of strengthens that particular idea. I did mention uh, Norwegian traditions, and uh, in Norway, um, we'll see, see it in uh, quite a few, actually, Scandinavian countries. Uh, again, this idea of community and multiples of light, only this time we're going to take our light and put it by the graves of our loved ones. And this is a tradition that exists cross-culturally, right? It just so happens that I happen to have some beautiful images of the Scandinavian, but it, it exists in South America, it, it, it's in Middle America, it ex exists in North America, that you will go to cemeteries and you will see lights added. But the thing about this that's kind of potent is this is a Christmas time tradition, right? This isn't kind of a, this is a way of kind of engaging family in the holidays. And so it transforms cemeteries into really kind of amazing moments, I think. Um, they've, that, this, well, all you have to do is live that far north, and all of a sudden, light becomes a really potent tradition. And so one of the traditions, I don't have an image of it, is that shopkeepers all have these big lamps out that they put in front of their shops with a candle, and that's their way of saying, we're open. It's not the flashy uh, neon open sign, right? It's a beautiful candle. But those cities are starting to get brighter, and so those are starting to lose their potency, right? And it starts to make, you know, the street lights are a little bit brighter, put the car lights in there in the mix, right? And all of a sudden, those traditions are kind of getting drowned out in the noise of all the light. So it kind of makes me wish for some slightly darker days when some of those potent traditions could be more visible. Uh, the Luminaria. Uh, we've... we've uh, we've taken this on ourselves. Um, the, the best I could kind of get to the origins was that um, there's some folks that attribute that to um, some Spanish merchants who started this tradition. And it, when it was first started, it was seen as lighting a path to your doorway or to the church, inviting the spirit of the baby Christ uh, on Christmas to your home, right? And so it was an invitation. And you know what? It still is, right? When we have a Christmas party, it's still an invitation. Um, not to the baby Christ, usually to Uncle Leroy uh, to get in, but still, um, it is an invitation. Um, and, uh, and it's nice that even in its current state, uh, it endures. The lantern traditions, um, uh, this one happens to be a tradition called Yi Peng. Um, and uh, it doesn't exist just in Asia. South America had lantern traditions as well. The lanterns really started in Asia as a way of signaling um, over long distances, right? You could put up a lantern and, and, and send a signal 
before we had the cell phone. And, um, uh, but now it's um, largely seen as a means of obtaining good luck. It's about kind of letting good luck in, but it's also a way in a lot of the traditions of getting rid of some of that negative stuff, right? You didn't, you didn't behave as well as you should have last year. Um, and so you light a lantern and you send that off. And when you send that off, all that nastiness that you did uh, is gone. Uh, some of us need bigger lanterns than others. <laughs> um, but it's a lovely tradition. And here's the thing that's really kind of important about this. That tradition, as I just, as I just described it, you could go into your backyard, you could light a lantern, and, and, and still accomplish the same thing. And yet, this is a communal activity. We're all coming together to engage in this. That's why it's potent, right? Because we're sharing in that idea. And, and, and then, obviously, one lantern is good, but a thousand lanterns, it becomes spectacular, right? And so it partly is about spectacle, but it also, I think, is a shared, kind of the shared identity, which is kind of becoming rarer and rarer that we have those kind of shared moments uh, together. Um, so, and that's going to become an important theme later on, this idea of kind of sharing. All right, we're going to get a little raucous now because uh, we're going to Great Britain and we're going to go to Scotland and Ireland. And when it comes, when it comes to nighttime in Scotland and Ireland, they can get a little raucous. Um, and so this is, this is uh, what's called Beltane, and <clears throat> it's essentially Gaelic May Day, right? Damn, winter was tough. Yes, it was, but it's, it's start, days are starting to get longer. It's starting to get good. Let's celebrate that. Uh, Beltane was actually, the, the moment that they celebrated Beltane was they determined which day it would be best to take all the cattle uh, into their summer pastures, and then that became the day for that festival. So it doesn't always happen on the same day, or didn't always happen on the same day every year, right? It was more about like, all right, I think this is the day to move the cattle, and then after the cattle are moved, we're going to have this celebration. It's evolved, as many of them do. So all of a sudden, right, we see that those are not kilts, right? There's, those are Japanese costumes. So as it's evolved, the contemporary version of Beltane included the torches, included the song and dancing, but now it's added a lot of costuming, or in some cases, some crazy costuming, or in some cases, the lack of costuming um, that, that went in. Um, and it's become kind of this raucous celebration of spring. And spring, right, and you're like, what, well, what's up with this, right? When are lambs born? Spring, right? So uh, spring and fertility, right, start to merge a little bit. So this festival became not just about moving the cattle, but, right, but also about, hey, it's spring. <laughs> So let's come to the U.S. for a second, and um, that is uh, Water Fire in Providence, Rhode Island. There was an artist named Barnaby Evans who uh, said, you know what, I think we don't pay enough attention to our river. We should, uh, he wanted to get people gathering again, felt that kind of sense of isolation, and I would have loved to have seen this pitch where he said, I would like to go out into the river and build these giant wrought iron cages, and then volunteers bring out hundreds and hundreds of cords of wood each night and fill those cages, and then we'll light them on fire. And somebody said yes to that <laughs> as an idea. And volunteers said, yes, we'll help you with the wood. And now um, when they do this, they get 40,000 visitors a night that come to see fire on the water, right? Uh, which, is, which is just fantastic, right? Um, so uh, they call them uh, braziers, those, those, great big, those great big wrought iron pits. And they really do have to buy kind of small boats 
fill those up with huge amounts of wood and keep that wood going over the course of the evening. We're getting bigger. The fires are starting to get a little bit bigger now. Uh, and we're still in the U.S., but now we're down in Louisiana. Anybody from, anybody from Louisiana? All right, I can tell lies then about this. <laughs> Actually, this is, a, this is a tradition that takes uh, place in St. James and St. John's Parish, which are just, just upriver from New Orleans. And um, this is a tradition that's believed to have come over from, from France, actually, uh, by uh, Marish priests. And uh, as a way of kind of marking the new year, although now this event happens on Christmas Eve. Um, so it's, it's, it's kind of morphed on that. Um, and it, the way it's also morphed, instead of just a fire that kind of acknowledges um, this, this date and time, a transition from one part of the year to the next, um, it's become a competition, as is often the case, right? And the reason it's starting to become a competition is because it was largely taken over by young men. And um, I think if, if women had had the opportunity to have a say on this, uh, it might have been a different festival, but this is a young man's kind of festival. So it gets really competitive, and at one point, they were building these things 40 feet high. And then they would collapse spectacularly, and finally, uh, city officials, fire marshals, and just people with good sense said, you can't go higher than 20 feet. So they all kind of went 20 feet. But it's still competitive, and, um, and they still have to have, they're built on the levees, and they still have to have individuals guarding their pyres so that somebody doesn't sabotage their pyre. Um, so it's still very competitive, even though it's only 20 feet tall. But the location now starts to become interesting to me and relevant to the Portland Winter Light Festival is I just showed you Providence, fire and water. We're on the levees, fire and water. Now it's not just about fire, but it's about fire's relationship to its place, to its context. And that becomes kind of potent in some other themes as we go on. But I wanted to show you some even bigger fires, right? So this is the Onio Fire Festival in Japan, 1600 year old ceremony that they still do. Um, and it's intended to drive away evil spirits. And the ash that comes off of that fire then gets placed on the body. So it's not just the fires themselves, but the ash coming from that. And it's back to that idea of fire as purification uh, that's in there. All right, another competition. This time we are in Italy. Uh, San Cassiano, I'm sure those out there are just like, oh my God, he pronounced that one horribly. But there it is. Um, and there's not much known about the origins of this, and yet everybody, every year it still happens. And you see one mound, you see, don't you see one mound, you see two mounds. And the reason for that is there's two districts that exist on either side of this river, and they both seek to build the best fire. So we're back to that competition again. This time it's district to district. Um, and um, uh, actually the picture probably tells uh, the better story in terms of that quality of those of those fires that are going on. Um, and the relationship to the architecture, the buildings around there too, is pretty darn impressive. Uh, there's a leap of faith there that's going on. But <laughs> look, at the, look at the scale of, of that fire. Uh, I'd, I'd come out to see that. Uh, that's pretty, pretty awesome. What I don't know is, how do you determine who wins um, in that? Um, and I think in the end, probably that doesn't matter. It would probably be just if you didn't show up and build your fire, that would be a, that's the disgrace. All right, uh, we're, 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 we're working our way around the world here and we, we've got to come back to Spain, Las Falls, and uh, again, competition, right? It's, 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 like, it's festival is competition. So uh, in theory, uh, it's a week-long celebration of St. Joseph. But I don't know if you can tell in here, these figures don't feel kind of religious in nature. And they'll even be things like Bart and Lisa Simpson built at these scales and things like that. So I think St. Joseph has largely kind of been left behind a little bit. 
Um, and uh, these are big sculptures that are made all year long by essentially kind of clubs in, in Valencia. And they're filled, they're, so they're paper mache and cardboard, so they're completely combustible. But if that wasn't good enough, they fill them with fireworks. Yeah. So, um, and then, uh, then they're on display like this all week long until the last night. And then the last night, they set them aflame. And again, uh, so what's really fascinating about this is that 25% of the population of Valencia participates in the, in the making of these. That's amazing. And some of them are involved in the making and others are hosting dinners as fundraisers for those, for those events. But imagine in your community if 25, if one out of every four people came out and participated in an activity, how amazing and potent that would be, right? So 25%. So um, I, I said it was about St. Joseph. Originally, this uh, celebration, in, in, not in its current form, but in its earlier forms, was again another one of those celebrations for the rites of spring. So it was pagan in or origin. And then the church came along and said, no, this celebration is now about St. Joseph. And initially it became a place for them to take broken relics and dispose of broken relics through fire, purification, um, uh, as a way of kind of disposing of those in a way that was ceremonial uh, and about the church. And so what's interesting is it's kind of it was pagan, religious, and I think it's largely become kind of pagan again. So it's kind of cycled through uh, a series of those. Um, and they used the, um, the figures didn't used to be mermaids and cartoon characters. Um, what really changed was the Spanish Civil War. And the Spanish Civil War, the church took sides, right, with, uh, with, with the government. And so um, if you were anti-government, that also put you on the side of being anti-church. And so parts of Spain have definitely kind of gone more, more secular, and this festival now is less about kind of the iconic imagery of the church and more about kind of popular culture uh, as a result of that. But it's fascinating, right, that these festivals are not separate from political, uh, political kind of ideas and political movements as well. So my hope is in this kind of very quick history where I've only showed you a fragment of festivals, that you come away with this understanding that Festivals, their origins are diverse. Uh, the things that they try to accomplish are diverse. The rituals that go along with them are diverse. Um, the thing that they share is that they happen at night and that light is an important part of, of, of making that ritual come to life, making those festivals come to life. Which moves us into, and I, told, I warned you, it would be a, 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 um, maybe an awkward segue. Here we go. We're going to start talking about our festival in the 10 minutes that I have remaining. Um, and the, it, the modern light festival also kind of connects us with other things, other introductions of light into the night, uh, fireworks displays um, that happen in a number of different forms, right? Uh, this one's pretty interesting. This was done by an artist in Paris. And um, so he did fireworks that said one night stand and then invited couples from Paris to make love in these tents um, with 100,000 visitors around. Um, yeah, I mean, I, let's just say that opened up the possibilities for light festivals, right? If that can happen, then basically, basically anything can happen. Um, uh, yeah. That was, it was just a one night stand. It was just one night uh, for that. Now the reason that the modern day light festival, part of what works, and I've talked a little bit about this, is day, the difference between daytime and nighttime. We don't do a festival that straddles daytime and nighttime. It's only at night, right? Now this is the Zocalo in Mexico City, and they have these trucks that pull up for you to get photographs with you and your families. Uh, at night. So that's the Zocalo during the day, and this is happening at Christmas time. That's the Zocalo at night, right? That's day, that's night. There's some magic there um, that's happening there. We're interested in that magic. 
This is actually kind of interesting. This is in Japan. This is their winter festival at night. That, it's lovely. No pro I, got, I got no problems with that, but look what happens at night to that place. So fundamentally, those of us who are involved in this light festival are recognizing that, that we can do some things at night that we couldn't do during the day. So the artists that we bring in, the performers that we bring in, are all taking advantage of that context of darkness um, to make something interesting happen. This happens to be in Fort Myers, Florida. That's their sandcastle uh, competition. And at night, they illuminate those sandcastles. And it becomes, they're beautiful by day, but there's just something really, really intriguing. And, and I'll tell you what, this isn't high-tech light. Somebody ran an extension cord and got a floodlight at Home Depot and threw a light on top of that sand. So it doesn't even have to be really kind of fantastic light. So the modern day light festival is really just taking advantage of a, some of those things. This idea of bringing people together, knowing the power of light, right? And then the third thing is we've got some emerging technologies that make um, some really spectacular effects at night. We've got lasers, we've got projection media that are going on, but we still have fire. So this is now the Portland Winter Light Festival. This is a steel heart that's kept burning all night long. People use it for warmth, because uh, it is cold, but it's also raining, so they're standing out there in the rain uh, by, to, to look at this thing. Um, but people are drawn to it. They are draw, they are, we are still drawn to fire as part of that. Um, and we bring fire in as performance, right? Now think about it. That's just a couple of the, 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 the amount of light, the amount of fire is not really great there. Look at the, look at the crowds there. Look at the size of the, the amount of people that are there to watch those moving flames. I promise you, if those were just batons that didn't have fire on them, that probably the attendance and interest would probably not be nearly as high. And sometimes we combine that fire with other things that are more high tech, as in this project, which is an LED um, uh, project that responds to kids hitting different, there's different buttons, but of course they only want, they want the gold button. The gold button makes flames, but the other one kind of uh, changes the color of that. As interactive as we can make uh, the pieces, we try to make that as interactive as possible. So here we have that flame, the low tech, fire uh, that's there, um, and then this geodesic dome, which is programmed to, it can, it can be programmed to um, sense the number of people in the dome and change the light accordingly, or the movement of people. It can be connected to the weather, um, clouds moving overhead, and it can change that light. It's a completely programmable LED dome, and it can take whatever kind of input you want to change the nature of the, the movement of the light, and the color display uh, in that dome. So we got high tech, we got low tech. This is a, a projection media piece. It's one projector like that. A little bit bigger than that, a little bit stronger than that. But the cool thing is there's software where they can isolate and that what looks like a sphere is flat. That's two dimensional. So it's just basically a piece of white cardboard and that white cardboard can get one kind of image on it, while the lower part of the building gets another image, and the upper part of the building gets another image. And what they do is they digitally map that. So that light hits, doesn't go through the windows, it only hits the surfaces that you want it to hit. Right? Really cool technology uh, that can be deployed. But bottom line, it's, people aren't there to see the technology. They're there to see this really cool moon in front of this building that's seemingly waving because this stuff moves. You can transform with this light. We're in an underpass under the freeway, right? So something that is horrible by day, right, becomes a barber pole, a moving barber pole at night, those, those fixtures, right? We can really transform those locations. This is one of the buildings near OMSI. There it is by day. It's an old uh, Portland General Electric building, transformer building. There it is at night. And off 
outside, uh, just across the street was a little photo booth where they would film kids playing instruments or walking through, and then they could, in real time, project those images of kids moving through the windows of that building, right? They could put on costumes and wait just a couple minutes, and then they would see themselves in that building, right? It's an amazing, again, one projector doing that, right? It's, it's, it's an amazing technology. Uh, some of them are high tech. This one was uh, uh, a local company did this one called Sticky Company. And what it does is you enter under those lights, you are assigned a light. So that person that's looking up in that image uh, to the left, he is, uh, that person has just been assigned lavender. So as he moves through that grid, that lavender light is always going to follow him. And he also has a sound signature. There's a sound that's associated with him. So you might imagine, this is kind of calm here, uh, the kids, when they get in there and they realize that they own a particular color, they, are, they try to dominate it so that their color dominates. So it's this really kind of raucous mix of movement in there of, of people trying to get their color to be the dominant color in that grid. This is the underside of the Hawthorne Bridge. Terrible, terrible kind of space during the day most times. But Jen Fuller added um, hundreds of handmade glass paper airplanes and then shot light through them. And that light that you see in the upper part of the image is the light that's coming through them and lighting the underside of that bridge. It's just, ah, I, get, I, get, I, get, I, don't, I get so excited about this stuff. It's just, it drives me crazy. Um, But it can't, doesn't have to be high tech, low tech. This is basically folded sheets of plastic that, that have been cut and a white LED light put inside it. It's dumb. It's dumb in terms of its technology. And yet, man, that's so beautiful. What a wonderful, why can't that be a permanent addition to the city? That's just amazing, right? This is just little LED magnets put on the side of a garage wall. And the kids would play with, and kids, everybody was playing with that for hours. It was like, I don't know if you remember that Light Bright, that game Light Bright, which you, which you put your pegs in and you could make pictures with different colors. That's all it was, was just a giant Light Bright. Really low tech. I think that, I think that installation, the person like needed $500 to do that, that light installation. This is just uh, off, those, off the shelf, those uh, little uh, uh, like 1970s um, uh, filament lights, right? They would put a colored light inside and they would have followed the, follow the strands of plastic out to do that. And they're fun to touch, they're fun to play with, um, but not a fancy technology, a really simple technology. What happens when we throw some lights in uh, with a couple of mirrors, right? Something, a little something magical happens. That's kind of the beauty of this. Fires are simple. Wood. Lights can be simple, but they can be really, really powerful. Some of the themes that still remain from all those other rituals, we're down by the water. Why are we down by the water? I'm not quite sure. We just decided that's where we wanted to be. It really, really, that's about, that's about as deep as we got on it. But what we discovered was we get reflections from that light in the water. So we get two works of light art for the price of one because of the reflections. And there's something about fire and water. There's something about light and water that makes that really, really potent. What are we interested in? Well, depends on who you ask why we do that light festival. For some of us, it's because we want, me, and, me, uh, me personally, it's like I like these temporary installations as a way of telling us what we might want to try in a permanent way in the city and get people thinking about nighttime and getting them inspired to do light at night. So we've got the Tillicum Bridge where the lighting was almost taken off of that as a project, right? What a shame that would have been, right? So advocating for light at night then becomes important so that we can highlight those things that we want people to see and put the awful things in the shadows. And it's about beauty, right? And it's about gathering. Last year, 150,000 people, Jinx included, 
came out to the light festival over three nights in horrible weather, right? Horrible weather. That's, we're not moving the festival to the summer, right? It's a winter, it's the winter light festival, not the summer light festival. And yet we still get community coming out in droves uh, to this free event, basically because they're connected with each other around light. That's the draw. It's back to that fire, it's back to that bonfire image again. So I hope you'll join us this year. First Thursday in February will be this year's version of the Light Festival, and I would love for you to come and be one of the throngs of people that are gathered around light. Thank you. So now I guess um, microphones are going around for questions. Um, as those are, as those, no, we ran out of time. Oh, break. Oh, so bathroom break and then questions. Um, one of the things I will tell you is this catalog, that you're welcome to take one, is from last year's festival. The new catalog will come out in January. So the only warning there is don't fall in love with a piece of light art that you see in there because very likely it's not going to be at the next festival. And don't use the date on that because the date is different. First, it's the first Thursday of February will be this year's version of the Life Festival. It's Thursday, Friday, Saturday. You're more than welcome to take that. And then those of you with really deep financial pockets, um, these, these over here are ways to sponsor the Light Festival. So um, uh, the, uh, the, the, all, my, uh, all my folks at the Light Festival would, would have killed me if I didn't put those out as, as well. I mean, literally, uh, they, would, they would have disin, disinvited me to all future Light Festivals. So, um, but do feel free to take a catalog. Um, and, uh, and then uh, online, pdxwlf.com, pdxwlf.com, and you'll be able to kind of, uh, as artists come on board, you'll be able to get a quick uh, advanced look at which artists are going to be at the festival this year. So we'll see you after the break. Okay, back at uh, 20 to the hour. Uh, so while, while you all are um, finding your seats, some questions came up that are probably going to be some general questions about the festival. And I could probably knock some of those out before we even get seated. Uh, first one, the festival is completely free to visitors. Um, parking is not. Uh, we don't get any money from the parking. Uh, but it's a good reminder to tell you um, that one of the reasons that light festivals have become popular internationally is for their economic development potential, right? So it just so happens that post-Christmas is a really bad time for retailers. It's a really bad time for hotels. Um, and in our festival last year, in three nights, uh, we did $2 million worth of economic development for the city of Portland which is not insignificant, which is why Travel Portland supports us, right? Because um, uh, I'm sure they like light, but you know, they've got their, they've got their reasons uh, for supporting us. Um, we are now located on both sides of the river. So um, the, if, if you want to kind of think about the center point for the festival, the Hawthorne Bridge, would be the center point for those of you who know Portland. Um, and we're on both sides of the Hawthorne Bridge, um, which means now that it's pretty good, like somebody asked about parking. Um, parking on the OMSI side can be a little sketchy. Um, and by sketchy, I just mean it fills up really fast. We were very excited. Um, this You're all sworn to kind of keep this in the room. But we backed up I-5 in our first year. And we, we kind of took that as a badge of honor. Um, uh, for our opening festival. Um, but uh, parking downtown now becomes a really kind of viable option. So the parking garages, there's a couple of parking garages pretty close to the, to the waterfront, to the Willamette. And, um, and then you can walk right down to the Salmon Street Fountain and there's where the festival uh, begins. We might even have some stuff Pioneer Square this year. So even the parking garages around there will connect you right to the festival. Um, and then um, you can walk across the Hawthorne Bridge, uh, but uh, the option is you can take the Portland Spirit 
uh, for free from one side of the river to the other side of the river. So that's a really nice gift that they've given to us. And in past years, can't say to this year, but in past years, um, we've had the Portland Opera aboard. So if the ride wasn't lovely enough, you could have the Portland Opera uh, performing for you as well. So um, it's an event, uh, it's been around uh, for about, uh, well this is our fifth version of it that we're doing it, um, but it's literally been, we've been working on it for 10 years. Um, and um, our biggest lift probably is fundraising, to be really kind of honest with you. Uh, we have really had to lean on the generosity of artists, which everybody leans on the generosity of artists, right? The ones that need the money the most, we're the ones that keep asking them to kind of give it away for free. And that's not the festival that we want to become. So each year I'm pleased to say that we've been able to compensate artists at increasingly higher levels, not to the level yet where we want them where we want them to be. So, but that is certainly one of our goals, is that all of our artists are actually compensated fairly for their work. Um, and so we're, we have aspirations for that. Most of our artists, um, if not all, are regional, right? So Eugene and Seattle are probably the farthest distances uh, for, for our artists, but most, an awful lot of them are from the Portland, uh, vicinity uh, that come in, which is a really kind of neat thing for us to be able to kind of have a homegrown festival that features uh, artists that are, are, more, are, are more local in nature. Um, some of them are artists, and then what we do is we also challenge our design firms, the landscape architecture and architecture firms, and they will do installations. That one where they kind of walk, we're walking through that triangular kind of space with the mirrors, that was done by a, a local uh, architecture firm. And so those pepper throughout the festival uh, events that are made by uh, design firms. And so they, those are self-funded. Uh, so they, they don't cost uh, the festival uh, any amount of money. Um, we work on a pretty good budget. Um, the, um, so Cincinnati just, Cincinnati and Baltimore both just did light festivals recently, and they, their budgets were um, over a million dollars for, for the festival, and we're doing ours for about $280,000. So, um, so I'm, I think we're all pretty proud of that, um, that we're able to kind of do it for a, kind of a shoestring budget. Um, but that's kind of the Portland way, right? We don't have the big Fortune 500 companies um, and that's why it's the Portland Winter Light Festival, not the AT&T uh, Portland Winter Light Festival, right? So, it's, it's, so there's, there's advantages to that. But really what it means is that that is a festival, if you go onto our website and you see who donated, right? It's not one big donor, it's lots and lots and lots of more modest supporters. And in some ways that feels right for the festival, that then it really is a kind of a community event. It's not an event bought by some big corporation that's then just given to the people, right? It's kind of, it, it kind of emerges out of, out of those folks. Um, so that's the, that's the festival. It starts uh, each night at, I think, 5 p.m. Um, and uh, ends at uh, 11 p.m. So it's five to 11. So you can imagine, right, that 150,000 people, three nights for just six hours a night, uh, that's, that's, a lot of, that's a lot of humanity that comes out for a kind of a modest period of time. We do have ambitions to extend the period of the light festival, make it more days, um, and expand the geography of the festival so it, it engages more of the city. Um, a good example of that is the Montreal Light Festival, which they actually provide buses to the various districts uh, in that light festival. That's a very large light festival. It goes over more days and a much bigger geographical uh, area. But, you know, we'll, we'll get there. We're, we're, we have aspirations. We'll, we'll get there. All right, so uh, I think that kind of covers my marketing campaign uh, for the light festival. Um, I'm willing to take questions on anything light related and nighttime related. Thank you. Could you tell me how the cost of that compares to like the fireworks we have on that are 
just flash by so quickly. Um, those are expensive too. Yeah, um, I don't know. I'm kind of light. I'm kind of light festival budget oriented, um, and so I haven't really paid attention to other things. I find it a little depressing when I do go go too deep into that and find out how much money people have gotten for things that we didn't get money for. So. Um, so I think, in my case, ignorance is bliss in that regard. So I'm sorry I don't have any more kind of information on that. Doesn't that, it always happens? The first question is the question you just don't have any you don't have an answer for. Yes. Okay. Hi. hi. I'm Jacqueline or Jackie with a Q. I'm a new member, but I find I've always found light fascinating, and the idea of light and fire and all. I'm interested in the idea uh, psychologically and religiously about fire in regard to pyromania, um, you know, how we're drawn to fire like insects are, you know, to light. But the pyromania aspect of it, and also the religious aspect of it, as, you know, historically the sun has been worshipped as a god before, you know, ancient history. But, you know, in regard to that, because I believe I've heard about the sun worship festivals too, but I don't think this is like that, right? I'm just curious about those two things, psychology and religion. Yeah, so I think um, I think they are related, though. I think I think you know the the sun is to summer what uh, what our fires are to uh, to winter, right? I think that they 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 are connected in a in a in a deep way. Um, so why why I, I think I'm gonna reframe your question a little bit to serve my needs. Um, and um, and, 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 and I, in that question, I, I get the sense that what we're, really, um, what we're really trying to get to is why. Why, is, why uh, is the, has the fire become such a, a potent part of those religious ceremonies? And, and I've got a couple of thoughts on that. And the first one is um, that fire uh, connects us, unlike so many things, connects us with every single sense, right? Every, every body sense that we have, right? It makes sound, we smell it, we feel its temperature, we see it, right? So um, all of our senses are activated through that, right? Um, the other thing that I think is really kind of potent uh, about that is um, that it is temporary, Right, that fire, the fire is not just kind of a permanent, these lights, we could leave those on forever, right? And fire, fire is temporary, which makes it special, right? If you get cake every day, pretty soon cake stops being special. I'm still gonna eat it, but it stops being special, right? Um, and so the fact that it's temporary, I think makes it really, really potent um, as an idea. And that it has to be managed. Right, and that uh, is another one. Right, that somebody has to tend to that in order to keep it going and keep it alive. That keeps that keeps fire kind of really potent as well. Um, and then I would say that um, it is simultaneously it gives us something. We can cook food on it. It gives us gifts. We can cook on it. We can stay warm with it. We can see with it. But it is a it is an element that is at the same time positive, it is also destructive, right? And so that gives it, I think, in, in, in religious terms, that gives it a lot of potency as well. Did I, did I get to what? Okay, great. Uh, my name is, here? Oh, okay, my name is Joel, and uh, I, ha I have some observations to make and then some, some things that you've inspired in my thinking. Light and darkness are metaphors that exist throughout our existence in terms of our literature, our art, religion, everything. And uh, for me, there's two things that really stand out in my memory. And one is, I always carry with me the impact of those shafts of light that go up to infinity, representing what happened during 9-11 and the Twin Towers. Right. If you've taken a moment in silence just to observe that, it's very, very moving. Right. As a young man, I remember, too, being kind of a Jack London fan, and I re remember the call of the wild and the opening scene where Buck, the dog, is staring into the fire and remembering, and I remember the word because I had to look it up, primordial 
his primordial existence. It was taking him, harkening him back to the past, to his very origins. And that was the beginning of the book. Uh, anyway, a couple of observations that maybe you could comment. Yeah, great, great observations. And um, yeah, I think it's, uh, I, 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 I think that um, light is in fact so powerful that it makes for good, uh, really great memorial uh, 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 situations, right? We use um, the eternal flame, right, in, in uh, memorials for unknown soldier, right? That um, it's potency. The, the challenge is, though, it loses its potency during the day, right? And so that, that might be why we don't see more light-based memorials is because people are seeking out something that's going to have a presence over the entire 24-hour cycle, not just the nighttime cycle. Yeah. Uh, Sharon, maybe you've answered part of this question, but uh, you know, Hong Kong, every night they have their light show and they have people stacking up there. And thinking, I love your idea. Thank you uh, about this light show. It's super. And Portland is a perfect spot for it. Years ago, you'd go by that white stag deer and everyone would always look at it. Why could, you know, have you thought about, uh, and this is the part you might not like about my question, why not have it more often in that uh, when there's a design review for Portland uh, around the waterfront especially, that somehow there's a fund or a tax credit or something where if the building incorporates something with a, a showy thing and have, a, you know, kind of the, like uh, Providence, I've been, you know, went there specifically for that light show, that could become a tourist draw and help the downtown, I would think. Just make it a big deal, and, and maybe it's not the greatest carbon footprint, but <laughs> it, it is something to preserve a downtown. Yeah, um, well, this answer is going to make it seem like I've got, I, I put a plant in the audience um, to, to ask that question. Because um, what, what, you, what you're getting at is kind of near and dear to, um, my area of research, the, the areas, I mean, the light festival is an activity that I'm deeply involved with and am really passionate about. But ultimately, my real interest is in how do we design for cities at night? And so that, that question feeds really beautifully into that. And the Hong Kong display is spectacular. Um, but what I would say is that, um, well, first let me, let me say, you're, you're absolutely right um, I went through every single Portland planning document I could get my hands on, and there were exactly, out of all that documentation, stacks and stacks of documentations, and they love images and diagrams uh, to kind of make their points, there were two pictures of Portland at night, just two, out of, out of 30 years of planning documents for that city. So as architects, landscape architects, urban designers, planners, um, we're largely conceiving of our cities as daytime conditions. Our drawings are daytime renderings. Um, some of us will then hire um, a lighting designer after the fact to come in and light up what we conceived. Um, but that's not really conceiving of a city as a nighttime condition. That's not really kind of paying attention to, um, to nighttime as a starting point. And so I'm really passionate about us starting to think about nighttime. That said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to push back just a little bit and say, um, I think it should be communities that are saying, this is what we want our nighttime identity to be. And if it is Hong Kong, great. Then there, and I think there's room in cities for it to be really kind of vibrant and active light, light um, in, in, in very lit ways. But I've got to tell you, I've been to some really remarkable cities that do nighttime really well that are largely much darker. And a couple case points in, uh, cases in point is New Orleans. So New Orleans loves its gas lamps, right? And so you, how, many, how many folks have been to New Orleans, right? Excellent. This is a New, uh, this is a New Orleans crowd, right? And um, part of what makes New Orleans charming, and I got to say, I like New Orleans better at night than I do during the day, just saying. Um, and uh, But part of what I love about it is uh, that they've got a lot of buildings with gas lamps on the street. And to, to make sure that you can, that those gas lamps are relevant, they've got a lot less light 
and the rest of the city so that the gas lamps read. And then if you go out into neighborhoods, what's really awesome is the trees have grown so big that they've grown around the street lights. So this is maybe unintentional, but they, they've grown around the street lights, so the street lights aren't giving off very much light at all. But everybody has a porch light or multiple porch lights. It's a thing, right? Everybody has a porch, and then everybody's got a porch light. And so as you're walking down the streets, you're, nor you're, you're kind of walking down the streets by porch lights. And as an added bonus, right, they've got their lights on inside the house. So you can go, God, I can't believe they painted their dining room that color, right? <laughs> <clears throat> Which I'm that, I'm that guy. I'm looking in. I tend to make sure I'm looking on the ground floor level, not up in the upper <laughs> floor levels. Uh, but, but, um, but it's pretty remarkable. It's an interesting place to walk. If they had really bright street lights, we'd get all that reflected light off up. We wouldn't see the porch lights. What would be lit would be the parked cars on the streets, right? Would be um, uh, maybe the sidewalks, but maybe not. It'd be really auto-centric. And what you have in, in New Orleans are beautiful places to be uh, that work really well. And they, they, uh, they're actually safer because those really bright street lights create dark areas. And what they're finding out with the research is that we feel less safe when we can't survey our surroundings. So low, even light, which New Orleans has, is the light that makes us feel safe and actually makes us safe. Because what they also found out was that um, the, bad, the bad folks are using those really bright lights. They're out in the shadows, and they're using those bright lights to go, what kind of jewelry do they have? Where is that person holding their wallet? Do they have a purse? So they're casing us in those bright lights. So the very thing that we think is providing us some safety may not be. There's some controversy about that, but I think it's a really interesting question. Where should the light come from? How bright should it be? Um, and I think that communities should begin to kind of develop that kind of I identity for themselves. And what, what's iconic in our community? What, what works of art or what works of architecture do we want to have pop out? So in Amsterdam, very low, half the levels of light on their streets than Portland has on its streets. But where they pop a bunch of light on is on the North Ch Church, the West Church. And the, it can be confusing even in the day, Amsterdam, those canal streets, right? But as soon as you see the North Church, you're like, oh, all right, now I know where I'm at. So what they do is at nighttime, they highlight those things that are not only beautiful, but are going to help us uh, navigate uh, the city at night. Right? So, um, so you're right. We need to do more at night uh, in terms of design. But I'm just, I'm standing in front of you going, I don't have that vision of what city should be at night. I kind of feel like we should go through that exercise together. Do lights. Like, do lights. Yeah. I, I hung boring. Yeah. Hi. Hi, my name is Kay. Um, I hope you can share your insight about the low, even light with the city of Salem. That's just a comment. <laughs> but uh, my question is, I assume you have strong connections, so to speak, with sources of power. And I'm wondering if you're ever able to use solar in your installation. So our festival, uh, one, of our, one of our primary, early and primary supporters is PG, Portland General Electric. And our festival is run completely off of renewable energy sources, which is great. The truth of the matter is, we don't draw much energy. Most of our, almost, almost all of our lighting is LED lighting, which has a very low power draw. It does draw power, but it has a very low power draw. So we're not using a lot of energy, but we're also turning off a whole bunch of lights. So, um, so we are probably, during the festival, Truth be told, we're probably using less energy than when the festival's not happening. Because we need, because ambient light is our enemy, right? Those bright sources of light make it so that our, light, our pieces don't pop out. Um, so uh, relative to Salem, I haven't, Salem is not one of the places where I've kind of brought my light meter around and started to analyze it. But I suspect that Salem isn't so different than a lot of cities. And, um, and you know, we don't complain about nighttime, probably because it's so familiar, right? When things are really familiar, we don't know what they could be. But now that we've had this time together, I'm going to charge you tonight with uh, taking a little walk around and looking at how your community is lit. And I'm going to highlight some things 
that hopefully will give you as much heartburn as they give me. And that is that our cities are largely auto-centric at night. So first of all, the cars come with a really powerful source of light, their own source of light that is bright. Why is it bright? Well, because the automakers have made headlights work for the worst case scenario. And the worst case scenario is driving on a rural highway and having a deer run in front of you while you're dri driving 70 miles an hour and that you have the stopping distance in order to not hit that deer. But when you come into the city, it's the same headlight that's there, right? But just in case that wasn't enough light, we've added light for all the streets. And they, what are they called? They're called street lights. They're not called pedestrian lights. They're not called ferry lights. They're not called, they're called street lights. Why? Because they've been put in by traffic engineers, well-intentioned, 50 feet on center, um, to illuminate the streets. And, the, and as a result, the cars parking along those streets. So now the brightest sources of light in our cities are the streets. But you know what? We park our cars too. And even though we're not with our cars, we want those to be safe, so we're gonna use that same sensibility about those really same bright light fixtures that are lighting our cars. And then as an added bonus, um, we're, we're accommodating those people that are in the cars and they need to find the gas station. So we're gonna provide a really highly illuminated gas station so that they can see it through their windshield going 45 miles an hour. Right? And so it's gas stations, it's billboards, and all of those things are the way in which are being lit up by things. So we're really, really auto-centric um, in, in terms of it. In the name of safety, but there's ways around that. We've got new technologies that are emerging for pedestrians and pedestrian walkways. There's LEDs that are in walkways that light the pedestrian as opposed to lighting the area. Uh, there is, in the Netherlands, they've got uh, paving now that is um, bioluminescent. So it takes on the energy of the sun and then glows at night and provides a beautiful walking surface for pedestrians. It doesn't use any energy. So there's really beautiful ways uh, for us to still make people pedestrian friendly, to provide good walking surfaces, to create places that are safe. It's just... We are, we're in kind of default mode. We're using the default sensibility about lighting right now instead of being really creative about lighting and, and about nighttime. So that was my, that's my soapbox speech. Thank you, for, thank you for, to both of you for putting that in okay. there. Yes. Hi, this is Deborah. Um, this topic has sparked. <laughs> eh. All right. Two comments that I want to make. Um, regarding an upcoming trip that I'm taking. The northern part of San Luis Obispo County, I will be in Paso Robles. And of course, after a day of wine tasting, night will come. And I will be standing on the edge of a field, a large field, that will be covered in one million lights. Wow. And it's quite an event. I don't have all the details. My sister has all that. But uh, that's going to be really an interesting thing. I'm th imagining what it looks like from the air, looking down on the earth. And I don't know if they'll be moving or whatever, but that's pretty cool. The other thing that I'm going to be doing is going to Yosemite. And I remember about the fire and water element. Remember when they used to throw fire at, from Yosemite Falls, and that's been outlawed, outlawed in recent years, but I, I think about that with such a dynamic um, ceremony for years and years in that park. Yeah. So, anyway, Well, well to, to your first, I know those are not com comments and questions, but comments but not questions, but to your first comment, um, we have a blog on the Portland Light Festival website. And if you were to take some images of that event, uh, it would be awesome to share that uh, with everybody. And we get, we get um, I think we had uh, 50,000 hits last year um, on that website. So, um, so you'll get that in front of a bunch of people. Um, so do share that with us. I'll be looking for it. Um, so, and, and I sit up here jealous. Um, <laughs> And then, uh, yeah, the fire and water thing, I think it actually comes back to those 
kind of experiential qualities that we were talking about before, they are at once mortal enemies, right? Particularly fire and fire does not like water, right? That is not one of the elements it wants uh, for its existence. And yet, uh, so together, kind of overlapping, that it's, it's not ideal, but side by side, right, then that experience is really, really enhanced. That quality of reflection, the, the cool and the hot, right, that, that, that kind of sitting next together in opposition, I think becomes really, really powerful. And so it's, I, I don't think it's an accident that we've got those moments of, of fire and water coexisting uh, in, in places. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I have a question about how you managed to get interested in all of this. Uh, uh, I had a roommate in college who was an architecture student. And the favorite time for the instructor to have projects come due apparently was around midnight on Saturday night. <laughs> and uh, so we had some very interesting discussions about uh, what, was, what was required and when it was required. But uh, how did you happen to uh, uh, get interested in this particular aspect? Well, if you, don't believe, if you don't believe that there are no accidents, then this is no accident. But if you do believe in accidents, this was a complete accident. So I'll let you decide. But I was delivering some mail to, uh, to the central location where they, where they have mail service, service on campus. And I noticed out of the corner of my eye, they had this area of surplus. Things are either going to get thrown away or sold back to things. And there was this shelf full of projectors. I was like, I asked the guy there, I was like, can I, can I borrow those projectors? He goes, you can have them. I was like, awesome. They were old projectors. Half of them didn't work, half of them did. But the half that did, I was like, I was like what, am I, what am I going to do with this? I didn't really know. I just was like intrigued by having a bunch of projectors. So I reached out to a, co a colleague in the art department, and I said, you all are doing projection, aren't you? And she said, yes. And I said, are you getting tired of just projecting on screens on flat surfaces? She goes, we were just talking about that. And I said, what if I had my students build interesting surfaces, and you had your students project onto those, onto those surfaces? I bet we could make something really cool happen. And so she said, yep. So we went on the terrace at night. And during the day, I had my students take this kind of plastic material that really comes in big sheets. It's really easy. You can, you can make curves, and you can cut it and make openings and things like that. And they made this really interesting series of spaces on it. And we got four of the best working projectors, and we put them up in four quadrants, and we projected light on them. And it was a piece of shit. Is the, it, was, it was just awful. I mean, I can't tell you. I, I, those, those images from that are deeply hidden where no one will ever find them. And what we realized almost instantaneously um, was that the problem was we had conceived of this thing in the daytime and just added light to it. So the next night, we took everything apart, we turned on the projectors first, and then the students built things in the context of that projected light. And it quickly went from being just awful to something really remarkable, just, just in 24 hours. And that doesn't often happen, right, that you are able to kind of correct your course in 24 hours. And, and that, that moment was an epiphany, right, saying, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. I've got, if I want architecture to be relevant at night, I can't just add light to something that's already been conceived as a daytime condition. And that was the moment. That was, that's, that's when, and, and everything I've done since then emerged out of that, that realization. I tell my students, right, that, I, that you will learn as much from a project gone wrong as you will a project gone right. And that's a perfect example of that, right? That, that uh, just how bad that project was, uh, was what led us into some new territory. Hello, uh, my name is Bob. And I, I, my question takes us in a, a direction you haven't mentioned, but I, 
it seems to be part of the overall package. There's light pollution, uh, the, the sky, the, 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 the heavenly bodies that we once looked at without any light pollution are there. In terms of uh, city design for light, are you taking that into account to minimize the unnecessary loss of light or projection of light up into the air so that we can have a better view? And that's also just around you because the, the brighter it is around you, the harder it is to see. Uh, the moon and the stars. So I've been able to be non-controversial up to this point. So I am really excited about sparking up. I don't want it to break out into a fist fight, but I think we're, this, we're getting into some territory. So um, light pollution is absolutely real. One need only look at satellite maps of cities and realize just how much energy we're using and how much light is spilling out there. Um, and so th I, we absolutely got, have to get control of that. That said, the primary means of doing that is the dark skies movement. Have you all heard of the dark skies movement? And fundamentally, it is, this is their principle. There should be no uplight. Everything should be downlight, right? So all, everything gets a, a thing on so there's no uplight. And I'm here to tell you I think that's the wrong strategy. Right? It's the right intent, it's the right intention, but the wrong strategy. First of all, complex solutions need complex answers. They need nuance, and that is a non-nuanced response. That's just a response that got light manufacturers happy because they could just sell new types of lights that were all down lights. But what happened is then designers just went, well, we're not going to make the lights any less bright. We are just going to have them all downlit. Well, what happens on a Salem evening in the wintertime when the, when the streets are wet, right? All that downlight's just being reflected right back up. And there's other movements afoot. We have this thing called heat island effect where we're running to use lighter colored pavings so that our cities don't heat up. Well, they're reflecting that light back up. And then it just magnifies, all that downlight just magnifies the, again, that whole street light kind of idea of just putting light exactly where we don't want it, on cars, on streets. And what we don't have is we don't have things like street trees uplit, because that's forbidden. We don't have building facades lit. That's forbidden. So I don't know if anybody's been to Tucson, but in Tucson, you can see the stars, but you can't see the city. You can see cars in the city, you can see roadways in the city, but you, you, I've got images of, that I've taken of Tucson where there's no way to know that you're in Tucson, right? That's a problem. There are places like Amsterdam, half the light levels, right? Low, even light. Their light fixtures don't meet dark skies, but they've managed to get half the light levels on every single street than we have in Portland, right? What I'm offering up is, complex issues need nuanced responses. And they're really kind of trying to treat dark skies as a silver bullet. And it's not, it's, it, it, it does some things well, but it, it creates a lot of problems in the city as well. They, it doesn't make cities livable. It doesn't necessarily make cities safe. It's just easy. And then I'm also going to make the case, back to this kind of identity, there are places in the city where we're going to want to see the stars. But there's also places where we want some nightlife where people don't, it's not about seeing the stars, it's about being able to have a drink in an outdoor cafe and enjoying, enjoying a light that makes people look good, right? <laughs> and they do that, right? You'll notice, right, that the light that you get in a good cafe, the places where you're like, he doesn't look so bad, right? <laughs> it's going to be a much warmer light, so it makes us look flush, right? And it tends to be a light that's more kind of frontal because if you get a light that's coming up, it's like when you play, when you tell ghost stories, right? All of a sudden you get shadows in places where you didn't want shadows before. When that light comes from the front, right? Um, all of our, of, all of our um, angst from life and how it's manifest in our face is kind of erased a little bit. So we have this ability to make people look good. We have ability to make cities look good at night and dark skies limits our potential to do that. So I share the goal, um, but I think that we need much more nuanced responses than what the current kind of dark skies uh, movement uh, gives us.
I think I'm next, Sharon. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. I, I, right here. Okay, there we go. Good, good. Yeah. Hi. Uh, one thing that didn't come up in talking about water and light is if you grow up on the salt water at night you and row, there's a lot of luminance light in oh, salt yeah. water. So bioluminescence is becoming a really kind of interesting phenomenon technologically. Um, so I mentioned the bioluminescent pathways uh, that are possible even today. They've, they've got bike paths in, in the Netherlands that you, that you can ride on with this beautiful purplish blue glow. It's lovely. Um, there's some folks that, and this is where it starts to get kind of, uh, we're going from the beautiful to the creepy now. Um, <laughs> But there are some scientists that are working on the genetic makeup of plants, and they've had some success making plants that glow, right? So this was several years back, but they had a tobacco plant that they could get to grow. I'm not sure why they chose tobacco plants that could glow. Um, it just, but something. Um, but they, they, they feel very strongly that they're going to get to the point where instead of street lights, the actual trees give off light at night. Which makes me kind of think of, what was that movie um, uh, with the blue, bit, the blue figures in it? Um, Avatar, right? So I'm kind of thinking Avatar, right? Kind of in those, all, all those plants glowed, uh, which is kind of interesting. There's some technologies that I think we just want to ask questions about, right? Do we want, does, does, is that what we want? Do we want a neighborhood of glowing trees? Maybe. Do we want a glowing tree park? That might be cool. Um, but as these technologies emerge, right, I think we need to ask the questions. How do we apply them? Where do we apply them? But it's really interesting because we are at this really lovely threshold uh, where new technologies, whether it's projection, um, there's a, 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 this is a, a side hint, but there's this projection piece that this Canadian artist did that's amazing for this plaza in Montreal where the plaza just feels like it's covered with white light. But as you create a shadow in that white light, figures emerge um, in projection form. And he's got a bit of software that lets him know where you are, lets people, he knows where you are. So he knows that if you've connected with that figure, and as soon as you create a shadow on that figure, it activates and it'll be like, Hi, how you doing? Or welcome to Montreal. Or um, hey, there's a good cafe that way. Or, but um, all of a sudden, what was seemingly just this simple white ground plane becomes interactive uh, with people. That's really kind of remarkable. The, uh, that same artist did another piece in New York, where you would go up to this thing that had two handles, and it would it would take your heart rate, and then there was a series, a big kind of field of lights. Your your project reminded me of that. A um, big field of lights, and it would take your heartbeat, and your heartbeat would start to blink on one of those lights. And then somebody else would come up, and there would be the next light, and it would be their heartbeat. And when all the lights um, get filled with somebody's heart rate, then they all flash together in simultaneously and go black again and wait for the next group of people to come in. And so we're, we're at this point where light isn't just neutral thing that we've got light that we can interact with. Um, there are facades on buildings that you can go onto a application on your phone, take a selfie, and it'll take a picture, uh, it'll take a picture of, of you and, and put that picture on, on the wall of the building. Do we want a city filled with those? <laughs> I don't think so. But those technologies are really kind of interesting, and so they beg the questions like, which ones should be temporary? Which ones should be permanent? Where should they reside? Which ones do we not want at all? And which ones do we want a lot of? And um, we're just not having those conversations yet. So that's kind of my mission, is to get those conversations started. Thank you so much. My name is Jeanette, and we drove across the the San Francisco Oakland Bay Bridge and noticed flickering lights all over as we drove, but couldn't identify any design. And later in that week, we parked so we could watch that. And I don't know if it's on the whole bridge. I think it's just on the San Francisco side. 
But anyway, they've programmed that with LED lights so that you see fish swimming through there and you see waves. And um, it is really mesmerizing. So you can see that if you park somewhere and look. You can see it from the water if you're on a boat. Difficult to identify when you're on the bridge, but apparently they had a, a temporary installation several years ago, and they took it down after two, day, two years, and then they decided to put a permanent one back up. Yeah. But I hadn't heard about it, so it was just a surprise, but I sure recommend it. And, and aren't surprises great? I mean, I think that's what, that's, for me, that's really kind of one of the exciting things is that uh, with the light, we can really provide some really spectacular moments, right? It doesn't have to be everything. Everything doesn't have to be spectacular, but, um, but how nice when you're rewarded for uh, moving around a city that you get, that you get something spectacular. And, um, and to tell the truth, most of our cities have something, have things that are already pretty remarkable but at night they're largely invisible, right? Um, I'm, I'm constantly amazed when I drive through Portland how many dumpsters are brightly lit. <laughs> As if somebody's really all about getting your trash. And if they want your, and I'm of the mind if they want your trash, they can have, they, they let them have the trash. Um, but it's as if those are kind of their pride, the building's prized possession is those dumpsters. And so there won't be anything lit on the facade, but the dumpster is just brightly lit. And then I'm also surprised that there are these really interesting works of art in Portland uh, that are not lit. And yet there are 30 times more billboards in Portland lit than there are works of art, right? So. That's what we're saying. That's what we're saying who we are to the city. We want more. Who was the one that kind of mentioned the, the Made in Portland sign, right? That's the, that's the kind of intentionality that we want. And that even though that started as a commercial, a commercial environment, because sometimes signs can be good, can be really interesting. Um, but, um, but let's be intentional about that, right? Let's, 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 let's require then people to do interesting nighttime signs as opposed to just doing daytime signs that you throw a bunch of light on, really bright light, right? So we're just, we're just, and it comes back to the problem of nighttime, right? Is it, it, it's like theater, right? Nighttime in a city is very much like theater. The lights go down in the theater, right? And then when a light comes up, basically you're being manipulated by the director um, to see what that person wants you to see on that, right? Now, imagine if all of a sudden the lights came up, right, and the lights came up on the person who's running the, the curtain, right, and they're, they're as shocked as everybody else is, right, your attention's on the wrong thing, right? I think we need to approach cities in a much more theatrical way. We start with that condition of blackness and darkness, and then we decide these are the moments that we want people to see. These are the moments we want to pre, uh, have people pre, appreciate. And, and it, it's harder to do that during the day because the sunlight will put its light on anything and everything. But at night, we have that option of really putting people's attention where we want. But right now, I would say we are largely guilty of not thinking about it, so we're putting people's attention in exactly the wrong spots. Okay, um, we were in the city of Bone, France a few years ago, and it was during the summertime, and we happened upon these big bollards, very tall bollards, that we thought, in the daytime, we thought, huh, what's that? But then at night, we saw that they, they must have had a festival of these projection videos on the facades of buildings. There was one along the full block long side of the hospice, that, that was showing a video of hospital people, you know, back in medieval days and, and this whole video of a story and then, and then, you know, spirits rising and flames and all this kind of stuff. And on the side of a chapel was, was the year-long change of the seasons on this, on this front of a church facade. Is that, and I've seen those bollards in a few other places, mm -hmm. not particularly at night, but is that like a worldwide kind of thing that cities do just temporarily? It seemed like a lot of work 
to get all those videos. Yeah, so I would love to say that our light festival was an original idea, but we've completely stolen it from other communities doing light festivals. So they do happen all over the world. Um, and um, now that there's a lot of light festivals, the thing that's starting to happen is that instead of paying an artist to just come in and do a temporary installation, there are light festivals that are buying those works. And then they will either trade or rent out light art installations to other light festivals. So you will see some of the same light art in various locations. And there are also instances where communities have gone, that was awesome. Let's keep that one up. Let's keep that one going. And they become more of a permanent installation uh, in a place. So that could have fallen in either one of that c categories. It could have been on loan. It could have been, it could have been um, just made permanent by, by virtue of a community going, we, we want to keep that as part of the city. Jeff, down here. I have a question that, that goes along with that before we close down. Are there any of the installations that, that Portland can or would be willing to have permanent or to sell to people like PG&E who might want to have something hanging inside of a building? Yeah, so uh, let me help the artist out a little bit by saying that, talk about that sales part first. Um, so in the past, there have been uh, light installations where the artists, to offset their costs, have sold uh, their piece or portions of their piece. So that uh, airplane, those uh, glass airplane ones, you can buy those glass airplanes from Jen Fuller, and that pays for then her next piece uh, that she will do. We had one installation where there was a couple of hundred glowing bunnies uh, in a field, um, and those bunnies uh, were then for sale. So there are instances for that, and, um, and we list in the catalog, so for the next artist, there will be listings for all of those artists and contact information for those artists, and I think uh, if you are interested in a piece, they would be delighted to talk to you about that. Whether it's for sale or not, they would still be delighted to talk to you about that. Now, as far as the city goes, mm, so there are an awful lot of light festivals that are supported in a big way by their cities. So I went to Helsinki, for example, and Helsinki, the city of Helsinki pays for all of their light festivals. And I got to kind of hang out with the mayor, which was really, really awesome. Because um, I was the one that traveled the furthest to come to their light festival. So all of a sudden I had this, the problem is I didn't wear any nice clothes and they dress up really nicely in Helsinki. And so, so he was apologizing for this big, beautiful buffet. And uh, I'm wearing my biking rain gear uh, when everybody else is in tuxedos. Um, so I stood out a little bit, but they kind of went, oh, he's from the Northwest. It's fine. But anyway, so um, I asked the mayor, I said, so do you get your money back for this? And he goes, yes and no. We get a lot of it back in terms of revenues going to restaurants, and it really does help out the economic value of the city. But, we, but that's not our prime motivation. We just need it. We need it. This event is needed. It, it, it makes us happier uh, because we have this festival. So that's why that was his motivation and, and uh, for paying for that festival. We have not been able to get that same logic to the leadership uh, in Portland. And not a ding on them. We've got some big problems to solve. And a light festival doesn't seem like you know, uh, it, it ranks as well, except that I do believe it makes us a stronger community. Um, we are doing really good things in terms of economic development. So we're hopeful that eventually we'll wear them down and that we will get support from cities, from the city. But right now, um, our funding is largely from, from private sources. Got it. Folks, before we go, write down February 6th, 7th, and 8th on your calendars, please. And Jeff, thank you for a wonderful, wonderful morning. Great. My pleasure. Thank you all.